Alabama and North Florida Unitarian Universalists. My name is Natalie Briscoe, and I am the lead for the Southern region of your Unitarian Universalist Association, coming to you today from Austin, Texas. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to be virtually here with you for yet another one of your collective worship services. These opportunities to join together in worship to lift up our shared Unitarian Universalist values of love, hope, courage, justice, and joy are truly remarkable and are a shining example of how we can use our current difficult circumstances to foster connection, live our values, and embody our covenant faithfully together. So to that end, I am delighted to bring greetings from your Southern Region staff and your sibling congregations across the Southern Region and throughout the UUA. I am so excited for all of the great work that all y'all are doing together and your UUA is rooting for you and sending you all our love. As Surely as We Belong to the Universe by Margaret A. Keep. As surely as we belong to the universe, we belong together. We join here to transcend the isolated self, to reconnect, to know ourselves to be at home here on earth, under the stars, linked with each other. On a sleepy endless ocean, when the world lay in a dream, there was rhythm in the splash and roll, but not a voice to sing. So the moon shone on the breakers, and the morning warmed the waves, till a single cell did jump and hum for joy, as though to say, this is my home, this is my only home, this is the only sacred ground that I have ever known, and should I stray, in the dark night alone, rock me goddess in the gentle arms of Eden. Then the day shone right and rounder, till the one turned into two, and the two into ten thousand things, and old things into new. And on some virgin beachhead, one lonesome critter crawled, and he looked about and shouted out in his most astonished drawl, This is my home. This is my only home, this is the only sacred ground that I have ever known. And should I stray in the dark night alone, rock me goddess in the gentle arms of Eden. Then all the sky was buzzing, and the ground was carpet green, and the weary children of the wood went dancing in between. And the people sang rejoicing when the field was glad with grain. This song of celebration from their cities on the plain. This is my home. This is my only home. This is the only sacred ground that I have ever known. And should I stray in the dark night alone, rock me goddess in the gentle arms of Eden. Now there's smoke across the harbor, and there's factories on the shore, and the world is ill with greed and will and enterprise of war. But I will lay my burden in the cradle of your grace, and the shining beaches of your love and the sea of your embrace. This is my home, this is my only home, this is the only sacred ground that I have ever known, and should I stray? In the dark night alone, rock me goddess in the gentle arms of Eden. Rock me goddess in the gentle arms of Eden. As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground, as that little sprig grows into a healthy stem, as that stem grows into a stalk and forms a bud, as that bud slowly opens with each new day to form a rose. Let us be like that first hint of green, renewed by the warmth of the sun's rays, 
and ready to emerge with a new energy, ready to face the day. We like this chalice to bring a glimmer of warmth into our space. Good morning. My name is Jamie Dingus, and I am the settled minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. Over a year ago, when we were just about to hit the one month mark of quarantine, a poem started to circulate about life and love and grief and resilience in the times of pandemic. The poem spoke about neighbors caring for each other at a distance and the holiness of doing one's part for the good of the community. It spoke of loss and sadness and frustration too. And one of the lines in this poem that was written by the Reverend Marcia Stainard read, but today you could see fish in the canals in Venice and the swans have returned. The skies over Beijing are clearer than they've been in a decade. And there was this sense in that naive moment that feels centuries ago now that the little break, the respite of the lockdown that we had all assumed then would be ending by summer would bring with it relief to our desperately hurting planet. Do you remember that? We all thought, finally, no more driving, no more flying. Maybe this is what we need. Maybe, just maybe, we will lock down so tight that we will save our neighbors and our planet too. What a gorgeous hope we had. I love that we were able to muster it in that moment, taking comfort in the hope that while we were suffering, perhaps, the planet would heal. And sometimes, friends, what we hope for doesn't work out that way. We know now that that would not truly be the case, that the crisis facing our planet continues despite our experience of pandemic and that issues around climate change, environmental destruction and extreme weather would continue to ever increase in severity day after day. Perhaps we can learn something from that impulse though. In those lines of poetry, that not quite possible hope. Perhaps that sense that all of us working together, changing our behavior might just be the thing we need if we wanna make a real go at evading climate disaster. Perhaps that sense that our planet's hope for survival is inextricably linked to our care and our action Truly, this might be the reminder we need. This week around the world, people are celebrating Earth Day. 
At present, Earth Day is recognized as the largest secular observance in the world, marked by more than a billion people every year as a day of action to change human behavior and create global, national, and local policy change. We see it each year with its blue and green school projects brought home, its reminder to reduce, reuse, recycle, the corporate commitments to sustainability highlighted in high budget TV commercials during this week in April. Like many other marked days in our calendar, we've lost touch to some degree with the radical and groundbreaking roots of this celebration. As you may or may not remember, the first Earth Day took shape in a moment of crisis. In 1970, as the long felt impacts of rampant industrialization were beginning to show absolutely disastrous environmental effects, Earth Day was launched to unite people around a shared notion of responsibility to our planet. Groups that had been fighting individually in silos against oil spills and polluting factories, power plants and toxic waste dumps, pesticides, the loss of wilderness and the extinction of wildlife. All these people united on Earth Day around shared common values. And the power of that collective organizing made real and lasting policy changes that have certainly slowed down some of the most devastating aspects of climate change. Earth Day brought together people who shared an understanding of the Earth's value and the Earth's fragility and encouraged collective action. People felt solidly rooted in the truth that it is this planet home that we share that most connects us. And people committed to acting in ways to protect it. In this commitment, they sowed a long lasting sense of hope. In our Unitarian Universalist faith, we covenant together around seven shared principles, the last of which is the respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. This principle asks for us to act in the world informed by two truths. The first is an understanding of interdependence. We as individuals and as human beings, we are entirely dependent on the resources in our environment and on the other organisms living on this planet. And we impact all these other creatures and plants and places that call the earth home. The second truth and perhaps the larger challenge is to respect this web. We are called by our faith to live respectfully. That is with deep understanding and reverence for the delicate balance of life that we find ourselves in. In both truths, care for our planet is at the foundation of our faith. And so we have this poem and this holiday and this principle, we have a not quite realized hope that our current crisis might lead to change. We have a celebration that for the last 50 years has brought people together to combat climate change. We have a principle that reminds us that the core of who we are as individuals and in community is bound up in what we need, who we help, and what we destroy. The connection, the thread of the web that weaves between all three is a knowing, a knowing that we belong to the earth, and a knowing that we share a collective culpability in whether the earth recovers or continues to decay. Yes, friends, we are connected to our planet home and we are connected to every person and creature who inhabits this planet through a delicate web of interdependence. Like a spider's web, we pull taut and let slack the strong but fallible threads as we move and use resources. We are connected. We share in common the experience of this earth. We are connected. Where we have ripped holes in the web, we must either do the work of repair or find ways to prevent further rips and tears. We are connected and there is only so much web. 
Yet I'd be remiss not to mention that though humans are the cause of climate change and climate disaster, it's really the actions of about a hundred companies that are so careless with our fragile web that they've caused more than 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions that choke the earth. That two weeks without driving our cars would end climate change. That a yearly reminder to reduce, re reuse, recycle would end climate change. That we continue to imagine that our individual choices to help the earth will do all that must be done to change the tide. I wish we were that powerful. I wish that was true. But in reality, as heavy as our footsteps are on the web of life, the tears and rips we make are insignificant compared to the gaping holes left by these companies and their irresponsible environmental practices. And so perhaps we take our care for the planet and our respect for our interdependence and work toward larger systemic shifts that would bring more accountability to these larger entities. No matter what we do, we have a lot of work ahead of us. I believe that our responsibility to the earth is foundational to our faith. That is that collective action has real impact that the solutions we need to this climate crisis go far beyond any individual actions we could take, but are out there when we collaborate and organize. I believe that this problem we have in the world is deep and complicated and unsure. And despite our not knowing, we must move through this life mindful of our planet's wounds and searching for solutions that will bring healing and safety before it is too late. The solutions we seek to climate, to climate change are elusive and complex. In an interview, one of my Divinity School professors, author, conservationist, and educator, Terry Tempest Williams, spoke about the experiences of teaching about environmentalism and environmental collapse with students, specifically those who are part of a generation younger than her own. In the conversation, William said, I don't tell them anything. I listen. I'm so moved by this generation, how wise they are, how open they are, how curious they are, and in many instances, how broken they are. This generation doesn't have illusions. They're interested in source, be it in growing their own foods or issues of sustainability. They're well-traveled, and yet I think many of them are now cleaving closer to home, figuring out where to take root. And then she pauses and laughs with the interviewer. And maybe I just lied. I do say one thing to them. Their question is always, so what do we do? And for me, it's not what can we do, but who are we becoming? I wanna end with this question because I think perhaps it is the central question of our lives. Who are we becoming? As we live on this changing, burning, choking planet, who are we becoming? As we vacillate between looking around and looking away, who are we becoming? As we remember our own complicity, and call out the larger egregious acts of corporations and companies. Who are we becoming? As we try to live and thrive and love as people of faith in our own delicate and beautiful corners of this fragile life-giving web. As we try to hold onto hope in moments that don't often feel hopeful. Who are we becoming? My prayer for all of us this morning is that in this season, we become more aware of our deep interdependence. Let us become more gentle, knowing that our impact is felt throughout this web of life. Let us become more hopeful, even when we know it will take more than just our hope, our gorgeous hope to make real change. And let us become deeply committed to impacting the kind of radical shifts that might yet heal this beautiful planet home that we share. Friends, 
Who are we becoming? Who might we all become together? Blessed be and amen. I took a road trip for this one. I'm in Geneva, Alabama, way down south. And this is believed to be the oldest and the largest living oak tree in the state. And that is relevant to today's story. Welcome to Time for All Ages. Our story today comes from this book, Wisdom Tales from Around the World, published by August House in Atlanta, and they have given us permission to use the book. This one is one of the tales from China. Specifically, the story is a Taoist tale that is old. This story goes back centuries. The Useless Tree. That's right, I said useless which might be a bit shocking to hear on a Sunday morning. But let's explore this through the lens of this story. A great grove of trees once stood on the hill where just one gnarled tree stands now. Long ago, the woodcutters had passed it by saying, we'll never cut a good straight board from that twisted tree. So they left it alone and went on to another tree. And then the loggers came looking for logs and they said that twisted tree will burn with a foul smell. So they let it be and they cut another and another. And then the carvers came after the soft grain wood and what do you think they said? They said this twisted tree won't do us any good. This is a naughty old tree. <gasps> Not that kind of naughty. Naughty with knots. K-N-O-T-S. That is a naughty old tree. So they too let it be. And they cut what? Another. And another. And they left that big old tree alone. Well, in time, that large gnarled old tree stood alone on the hill. Now during the day, the children would come and play in its shade and then in the evenings the old men would gather about its huge trunk and they would sigh and talk about their lives and probably politics and philosophy. Oh, one man said, he was an old man, what use is it to be useless? Well, another old man heard that and he pointed up and said, look above your head. At one time, there was an entire grove of trees right here. But now just one crooked tree still stands, thick with greenery. Had this useless old tree been useful, my friend, it would not have grown ancient with fine spreading limbs. So at this point, you might be thinking, what, what? <laughs> I kind of did the same thing. So I did a little additional research. I looked up this website, mrsmindfulness.com. Melly O'Brien runs this website. And I like what she said. She actually wrote an article about this story. She says it's a story about letting go of approval seeking. It's an important reminder of how often our sense of self-worth is hitched to being useful to somebody else. We're often evaluating how useful we are to a company, to our partner, to our community, to our friends, to our family, to the world. She says there can be a sense that our worth is only in our doing and the background fear that our being is not enough. And here's where we get down to it. The reality is, according to Melly, every single person is valuable and worthy just as they are. And each one of us makes a difference to the world surrounding us. No one is useless. 
no one is useless, even if they are seen that way by some people around them. I don't know if that resonates with you or not. Maybe you'll reflect on this as you go, and I wish you a really great week. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Aspen, the current acting MRE from the small but mighty Auburn UU Fellowship. Our individual communities have joined together today to deliver a service focused on the challenges faced by this planet we temporarily call home. As we consider the gift of life and abundance that she provides for all of us, we are reminded of our responsibility to pay her back for all that we continue to depend on her for. This is why we have chosen Alabama Interfaith Power and Light as the recipient of today's combined offering. The mission of Alabama Interfaith and Light is to be faithful stewards of creation by responding to climate change through the promotion of environmental justice, energy conservation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy from a faith perspective. Your donation will be collected and distributed by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Birmingham. The website's right up there. And I do hope you'll take a moment to click on the link, find your way there, and make a donation to this important cause. Thank you for your time. As we enter our meditative time this morning, we are reminded that we are called to do this work of being together and that one of the purposes of beloved community is holding one another's joys and sorrows in community as we go through this journey of life with one another. We celebrate that all of our Alabama and North Florida UU friends and family are gathered this morning as a reminder that no matter where we go in the state, we are not alone. Using the chat feature in YouTube, by speaking it aloud, or by hearing it on your heart, please share with us what is on your heart today.
please hear a spoken meditation followed by a moment of silence. Today's spoken meditation was written by Laura Bogle. We gather here to remember this is our home, but not just ours. This land we live on, this water we drink, this air we breathe, these old mountains that hold us steady to our ground, these forests that give us their healing green, these flowers that give us their beauty and fragrance, these fields that give us our daily bread, these stars that show us our place. The wilderness and the tame backyards, all of it is our home. We remember the ancestors who have lived on this land and who have shaped it. The Creek, Muscogee, Alabama, Tunica, Biloxi, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Coasati, and Yuki people. The settlers, the mountaineers, the farmers, the hunters, the immigrants, the artists, the families, the explorers the business people, the engineers, the builders, the scientists, the teachers, the workers, the leaders. We inherit their choices. We honor the animals and creatures that have made their home in this land, the ones here now and the ones that used to be here. We envision the future generations who will live on this land and let their voices fill our hearts. We gather here to remember today that this is our home, but not just ours. Amen and blessed be. One, two, See your brother standing by the road with a heavy load from the seeds he sowed. If you see your sister falling by the way, just stop and say, Hey girl, you're going the wrong way. You've got to try a little kindness, yes, show a little kindness. Just shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, well, you can of the narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded street. Don't walk around the down and out, lend a helping hand instead of doubt. And the kindness that you show every day will help someone along their way. You've got to try a little kindness, yes, show a little kindness. Just shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, well, you can overlook the blindness of the narrow
here on the earth. Around us, world immensities of time and space, a universe infinite in all directions. How small our hopes and cares seem amid the panorama of creation. Yet we are not separate from the cosmos. We have evolved and grown out of it, like the leaves of a tree or the waves upon a sea. And our thoughts are its thoughts our lives a manifestation of never-ending vitality, our spirits a microcosm of the beauty and creativity of the whole. Fill us then with reverence and compassion for all who are our kin, cloud and sun, sibling and cousin, the multitude of beings who share this improbable and never-to-be-repeated moment all expressions like ourselves of the mind at large, the spirit at play, the dynamism at work in whom we live and move and whom we will never know. I'm Reverend Alice Silty and I serve the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. The seed was planted a few weeks ago. That seed being the quote from Wendell Berry the earth is what we all have in common. Once a seed is planted, it drinks in what it needs to grow. Nutrients from the soil, sunshine, water. Once you've planted a seed for a worship service, a vision begins to grow. Last Sunday, I was back with my congregation in Pensacola for the first time since March of 2020 when after a flurry of phone calls to decide what to do, we mercifully received a clear message from our Unitarian Universalist Association president, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, telling us that it was not in anyone's best interest for us to return to our buildings at that time. Thankfully, we did not know that the time would stretch to more than a year and that it would be filled with so much heartache and loss. If we had, I doubt we would have so quickly found that burst of energy that birthed our creative interest and drive to learn new ways to connect and sustain ourselves and our communities through this long haul. With this idea in mind, that the earth is what we all have in common, I traveled last week from Huntsville to our southernmost border. Not having traveled for a very long time, I was taking in every bit of the landscape. Leaving Huntsville, I drove along the Wheeler Wildlife Refuge across the Tennessee River and Wheeler Lake continuing through the lush greenery that lines I-65 as it twists and turns through the foothills of the Appalachians in Birmingham, past Oak Mountain in Pelham. Reaching Montgomery, I crossed the Alabama River and continued on to my exit that took me through more rural areas of Escambia County to the Alabama-Florida state line. In a few more miles, I found myself on Pensacola Boulevard, which is also Highway 29, in front of our Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. It is located on the north side of the city. From there, I picked up I-10 near the church to continue on to where I stay. And before long, I'm driving over miles of bridge 
across the East Bay to those sandy white beaches of our beautiful Florida, Alabama Gulf Coast. All this we have in common. Lakes, rivers, creeks and streams, mountains, bays and beaches, lush vegetation, and I haven't even gotten to the birds and the bears, the deer, the raccoons, assortment of other captivating wildlife and sea life that will surely grab your attention somewhere along that journey. All this we have in common. Our congregation gathered outside on our property, masked and appropriately distanced from one another on a Sunday morning when by some miracle, the rain that had been falling for days took a break and allowed the sun to shine down, bringing warmth and brightness to our gathering. The outside, nature, has been a refuge for many throughout this pandemic. Separated from important relationships with other people, our loved ones and family, friends, we looked elsewhere to find connection Wendell Berry is right. The earth truly is what we all have in common. Around the world, people were discovering the beauty of nature as a sustaining force. Walking, hiking, bike riding, relaxing outside, gardening, watching the wildlife, taking photos and posting them on social media. Our connection to nature has had a power to hold us and hold us together. After a few weeks of lockdown, sights and sounds not visible before that were being revealed. Last Earth Day, the Himalayas were visible from a spot in northern India for the first time in decades. The night sky in Italy lit up with stars. The songs of birds were traveling farther through the air. Coyotes strolled along Michigan Avenue in Chicago and near the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Sea turtles nested with less disturbance from India to Costa Rica to Florida. What did we learn? The earth and its inhabitants, including us, are resilient and capable of healing and evolving. Will we acknowledge what we've learned? Will it make a difference in our future choices? Only time will tell. I came across a song recently that reminded me of all of this and of a class that I took some years ago at Meadville Lombard taught by Carl Peters, who wrote Dancing with the Sacred, Evolution, Ecology, and God. It made me think of the spirit we need if we are to embrace the creation with love and concern and joy. If we are to learn to live as if the earth we all have in common is our mutual responsibility. The words are by Thu Elliott. It was not written for a pandemic time, but like most art, meaning may be in the eye of the beholder. He wrote, Spirit, I have heard you calling, like a memory long grown dim, crying from creation's moment, seeking voice from deep within. I have heard you in my longing, I have heard you in my pain. Now I feel you moving in me, feel you burning like a flame. Now I see you all around me. Now I hear you call my name. Now I speak the words you give me. Now I feed creation's flame. You are speaking through my pain. Now I feel you moving in me and I'll never be the same. Since you moved upon my waters, since you spoke and set me free, I have yearned for this communion, for your fire 
inside of me. Now your love defines my longing. Now your love shines through my pain. Now we dance in endless union, singing out creation's name. May that dance, that energy, that connection be the spirit of life and love that lives within us and within which we live. May we do that dance. May it be so. Begin again, 
mist and ice, a host of changes, all that courage will allow. With a cup, the holy chalice, west we ask you, be here now. Love a spirit, intuition, in the center of our souls. In your love we find relation, all connected we are whole. Timeless mystery, quiet conscience, deepest values voice inside. With the drum and with the cauldron, this we ask you, be our guide. We have basked in the warmth and beauty of this flame and this community. As the chalice flame is extinguished, let us carry its glow within. Let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. Our benediction is from Norman V. Naylor. Our eyes and minds turn now towards the ordinary, leaving this digital space made sacred by your presence. Take with you at least some seed of understanding, hope, and courage, and drop it into the confusion of the world. Nourish the seed that it might grow as a tree of life, giving shelter to the weary and hope for the despairing. Be yourself a branch of the tree of life. Amen. Blessed be and go in peace.